where he also completed a residency in occupational and environmental medicine. He is a professor and the John P. Holton Chair in Health and the Environment and the director of the Global Health Institute at the University of Wisconsin uh, in Madison. So more than 20 years ago, um, I was the environment section uh, program planner for the APHA annual meeting. Um, and uh, uh, a young, younger, John Patz, uh, uh, then at Hopkins, uh, approached me to see if he could organize a, a session on climate change and public health. It seemed like a little bit of a fringe idea 20-something uh, <laughs> years ago. Um, but uh, he was very persistent, and so I said, sure, why not? Let's, let's have a, a session. Uh, so we planned that, um, and it was quite successful. Uh, in the ensuing years, though, in these past 20 years, Dr. Patz has really become a leader in connecting uh, the world of climate science and public health. Uh, he's published very widely uh, on climate impacts and health, a variety of kinds of impacts. Um, and he's the co-editor of an outstanding text uh, on this subject. And then since, since John organized that session so many years ago at APHA, public health impacts have really uh, emerged as a central motivator for uh, international agreements on, on climate, um, climate action. Uh, in fact, uh, the American Public Health Association uh, this year uh, declared 2017 the year of climate change and health, and they're organizing their, uh, it's the overarching theme of the upcoming annual meeting uh, this fall. Uh, so um, uh, just one last thing, Dr. Patz was a contributing lead author of several reports of the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, uh, which was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007, along with former Vice President Al Gore. Uh, John has also been the recipient of many other prestigious awards in recognition of his leadership in this field. So uh, please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Jonathan Katz. Jerry, thank you for that kind introduction, and, and Anna Diaz, the, the dean here, thank you for inviting me uh, to give this presentation. We go way back, all three of us back, uh, I won't say how many decades ago, and, uh, together at Hopkins, but uh, it was really uh, Jerry's leadership at uh, the American Public Health Association uh, and his allowing me to put forth this fringe idea of climate change and health. He was the, the strongest proponent at that time. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you a summary of some of the uh, risks from climate change and why I believe that climate change is the greatest uh, environmental public health challenge that we face. But then I'm going to dive into the real title here about why combating climate change might be the best opportunity that we have to fight chronic disease. <coughs> So there's a, a bad news and a good news story, and hopefully more good news than bad news. Let me just start with some of the climate science. Um, many of you have seen these maps from the latest uh, Intergovernmental <coughs> Panel on Climate Change report. Uh, this is a uh, lower uh, representative concentration pathway uh, as far as burning greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that's about one degree average uh, rise around the world. This is uh, the uh, higher RCP, more emissions, uh, taking us to about 7 degrees centigrade on average, which is quite striking as a global average. Now, of the students in the room, which one do you think represents business as usual? The left side or the right side? The right side, that's right. So this is where we're, we're heading unless we start doing something to curb our fossil fuel consumption and reduce our emissions. Now, many of you have seen this slide. I've been presenting this slide for, you know, some 20 years now. Um, that there are lots of ways through which climate change affects our health. Many climate-sensitive health outcomes. We know that people die in heat waves. Uh, we, we know that there are some sensitive air pollutants, especially ground-level ozone, <coughs> smog, pollution but also biologics, aeroallergens and, as an issue. Um, and then uh, examples of how small changes in climate affect infectious diseases, especially those carried by insects 
of vector-borne diseases. And remember, it's not just temperature. It's extremes of the hydrologic cycle. These are the three main areas of climate, the, the physical attributes, warmer temperatures, uh, sea level rise, mostly from thermal expansion of salt water, um, and land-based glaciers falling into the ocean. But this bottom one, hydrologic extremes, more floods, more droughts, extremes of the water cycle could lead to um, contamination. And so you see here, waterborne diseases is one area of infectious disease that we're worried about. But if you have droughts, you also have issues with food supply uh, and water supply. So these, of course, foundational for public health. We must have adequate food and, and water supply. And on the bottom, if we, if we have more floods, more droughts, uh, more extremes in climate variability, uh, and weather disasters, uh, aspects of mental health and post-traumatic stress syndrome, and this bottom one, environmental refugees, people, populations forced to move either from sea level rise or from droughts, um, forced to migrate, very difficult to quantify this one, whether it's environmental stressors or political problems. Um, but frankly, I think this could be the iceberg, under the tip of the iceberg as far as big problems. <clears throat> now, because it's National, uh, International Women's Day today, um, and I don't have anything to wear that is red, uh, I did make this, uh, make this red, and I also, <laughs> also want to show you uh, a couple of new studies that just came out. Uh, I was at the Consortium of Universities for Global Health meeting in uh, San Francisco last year, and some studies came out of Southeast Asia on um, uh, hypertension and preeclampsia in pregnant women from increased sea level rise and storm surge bringing more salt into groundwater. So salt water and drinking salt water increasing the risk, very dangerous uh, preeclampsia and pregnancy. Um, so I needed to show that for International Women's Day, but also because um, it's, it's one of these, uh, another way that climate change affects our health. So this is one reason why I think this is such an enormous public health challenge when you look at this broad array of the many pathways through which climate change affects our health. I'll just give a couple of examples uh, with temperature rise. Uh, this is a modeling exercise um, out of Stanford, uh, Stanford and University of Washington, Seattle, uh, published in Science a few years ago, showing that by, by the end of the century, everything in red will have a 90% probability or greater of experiencing record summer temperatures. Never, you know, never, you know, the record, historical record hot temperatures. And when you think about agriculture and growing crops within a certain climatic envelope, um, the um, crop modeler in that pair, um, Roz Naylor, uh, estimated that by mid-century, we will double this number. Right now, uh, over 800 million people are at risk for hunger. hunger. That number could double because of these temperature extremes and the negative effect on food crops. Now, a little bit more bad news is food crops may decrease, but other plants may increase, especially weeds like ragweed. And this is a study uh, that was, uh, this is from a study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that was picked up from the US, in the, in the US National Assessment, showing that nationally, the ragweed season is lengthening. And you can see that as you go north in latitude, um, you get longer and longer um, ragweed season. Um, the United States is not universally warming. There are some parts of the United States, especially in the southeast, southern areas, um, that are not necessarily warming. And that's why you don't see an increase. But uh, throughout much of the United States, ragweed pollen is increasing. And there are studies that show that ragweed increases with, with warmer temperatures and with more CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, I've talked to some faculty here in the Department of, Occupational, uh, of uh, Environmental and Occupational Health, uh, some epidemiologists are working, uh, Jane, uh, working on the air pollution issues. And this is just to show that currently, you know, the 
the bad ozone days, the ground level smog ozone, yellow, orange, red, those number of days will increase dramatically in the future only from the temperature effect itself because uh, ozone is a secondary pollutant. It, it's formed from you know, uh, precursors, volatile organic compounds and nitrogen oxides that combine at high temperature and with UV light to give you ground level smog ozone. Those will increase those days that are dangerous for asthmatics uh, and other people with respiratory problems. Now, some people argue that global warming's greatest threat may also be the smallest. And for the students out here, what's the difference between you mammals and that mosquito, that invertebrate animal there? What's the difference? Besides the fact, Jerry tells me, as far as he knows, none of you can fly, <laughs> but, and most of you don't suck blood. So aside from that, what, what's the difference between mammals and insects? I think I heard it. Uh, temperature, body temperature, right? So our body temperature is pretty much the same. 37 degrees centigrade, 98.6 Fahrenheit. Whatever the air temperature is around that insect, that cold-blooded insect, that's the body temperature. Cold-blooded insect, its body temperature is the same as the air temperature. And if that mosquito happens to be <coughs> harboring malaria parasites, and these are the two, two main uh, uh, parasites of malaria, that cause malaria, Plasmodium falciparum, mostly in Africa, Plasmodium vivax, notice that as the temperature increases, the number of days that it takes for that parasite to develop inside the mosquito, cross the stomach lining of the mosquito and develop into an infective sporozoite stage in the salivary gland so that when she takes the next bite, she transmits malaria. Notice that the warmer the temperature, the faster the mosquito is infectious. And it's well known, even though malaria is very complicated, and there are a million different factors, it's well known that the biggest epidemics stem from uh, extreme climate and that you know, hotter temperatures lead to more, uh, more infectious mosquitoes. And notice that if it gets too cold, below a certain temperature, the development uh, time gets longer and longer until it's infinite. So you, that's why this is a tropical disease. You can't have malaria unless you have enough warm degree days to support these, this extrinsic incubation period in the mosquito. And the warmer it is, the faster the mosquitoes are infectious. Now we had an emergent disease um, this year, Zika virus, and there have been questions about was the extreme El Nino from last year a contributing factor? And a study just came out um, uh, two months ago out of the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and what they found is that the, the climate-related uh, vectorial capacity or the, the risk that a, one of these uh, mosquitoes would transmit Zika virus was at its highest risk level in over 60 years. And this is climatic factors that are driving this risk. Um, and so this came out as far as the entomological risk that Zika would be transmitted was the highest it's been in 60 years. This is the mosquito, Aedes aegypti, that, that carries Zika and also dengue fever and yellow fever and chikungunya virus. And what's important to know is that uh, we have a lot of information on this mosquito. Uh, this is, you can see, it's, uh, it's range throughout the tropics. And there's a lot of dengue fever carried by this mosquito, the same mosquito that carries Zika. Lots of information on dengue fever in, the, in Southeast Asia. And a study looked at the synchrony of epidemics in this region. Um, it's a seasonal disease. It, ha it peaks at a certain time of year. In, in, in uh, Latin America, the peak will be March, April. Um, so they asked the question, even though it's cyclical and, and peaks year to year, were there some years 
that were worse than other years in Southeast Asia. So uh, these are colleagues uh, of yours from uh, Pittsburgh, actually, um, that studied this, uh, this paper. And um, they looked at 18 years of dengue fever data, and they found that there were a couple of years that lit up in red <laughs> as being banner years for lots of dengue fever cases. Well, guess what? Those two years, uh, 1997 to 1998, and 2008 to 2009 were very strong El Nino years. In fact, 2000, uh, 1997 to 98 is the strongest El Nino we've had in recent history until 2015. So the El Nino of 2015 was as strong as 1997, but lasting longer. So the big question is, you know, did this extreme El Nino event have have a, a role in Zika virus. Now, of course, again, it's complicated. Uh, from the genetic fingerprints, the, the Zika virus in Brazil and throughout Latin America came from French Polynesia, so international travel, absolutely important. But just like when West Nile came to New York City in 1999, it was from international travel. But July of 1999 was the hottest July ever recorded in New York City. And that strain of West Nile uh, does better with, with warmer temperatures compared to Euro European streams. So the question here with Zika um, is, could this extreme uh, climate, these extreme climate conditions have had something to do with it? There are other sociological stories with dengue fever where people during drought conditions, they, they don't have piped water and they're in these informal uh, shelter, uh, these communities that don't have any piped water, they're in these favelas, these slums. Um, in a drought condition, you store more water. And so that also is important with this peri-domestic mosquito. It may have been a factor as well. Finally, I'll just wrap up by stating the obvious. Heat waves kill people, and we know from the European uh, heat disaster, you know, that many people dying in 11 days is a public health disaster. You saw a spike in temperature and an immediate spike in mortality. Uh, we've been modeling this in the United States, <clears throat> and you know, I, get, I get choked up every time I start talking about heat waves <laughs> and have to drink some water. <clears throat> so um, right now, New York City um, has 13 days that are 90 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer, or 32 degrees centigrade. So 90 degrees or warmer, 13 days. But from our uh, downscaling, from our uh, uh, clim uh, climate research uh, center, we have uh, looked at some modeling that shows that that number will triple by mid-century. So New York, instead of having 13 days over 90, that's going to triple to 39 days that are hotter than 90 degrees. And that's only 40 to 50 years from now. And this holds up for most cities that we looked at east of the Mississippi. So this lecture is more about chronic diseases, right? So I want to talk about a chronic disease related to heat and dehydration. And it's a disease that uh, occurs in sugarcane workers. This is a chronic kidney disease. And it happens in, in people aged between 30 and 50, pretty young to be seeing chronic kidney disease. Uh, it's in other places in the world, but this is uh, an area in Latin America that sees a lot of chronic kidney disease. And not only is it warm there, but along the coast you have um, lots of sunlight. And, you know, I've been meeting with people in your Department of Environmental and Occupational Health, and uh, they all know, and I'll just tell the rest of the audience about the wet bulb globe temperature, which combines temperature, humidity, and solar radiation. It's an occupational health exposure index for very hot conditions. And you can see these lines. This is uh, 26 degrees, 28 degrees, 30 degrees. These are international um, thresholds above which, once you go above um, a wet bulb globe temperature of 26 degrees, according to OSHA, you need 25% rest 
you need to rest a quarter of the time. Above 28 degrees wet bulb globe temperature, you need to rest 50% of the time and work 50%. If you go above 30 degrees wet bulb globe temperature, according to our OSHA standards, you need to rest most of the time. 75% rest, 25% work. Well, these sugarcane workers, by 9.30 in the morning, the you know, average wet bulb globe temperature is over 30 degrees. So, and with, and with sugarcane, if you saw the first picture, you, you burn sugarcane and then you harvest it. So the, the fires and the hot temperatures uh, lead to um, multiple uh, heat and, and dehydration conditions in these sugarcane workers. And with repeated dehydration, um, that is uh, believed to be the reason why you have this chronic kidney disease related to extreme uh, climate, climatic conditions. And we've done some modeling uh, with Tord Kalstrom and others that show that this is only going to get worse uh, with climate change. Now, this, these studies are more, uh, they're more men affected here, but of course there are studies that talk about climate change uh, especially uh, posing risks for women. And this is a statistic out of um, the UN uh, World's Women Report that 63% of households in rural sub-Saharan Africa uh, have the women as the water collectors, as agricultural workers. And so it's these outdoor workers that are mostly women in sub-Saharan Africa uh, are at, especially at risk. And because today is International Women's Day, I wanted to just make sure that that was up there because, again, I'm not wearing anything in red. So this is a women's health issue, um, very much so. <coughs> now, speaking of collecting water, um, remember, it's not global warming. It's, it really should be called the global climate crisis. Uh, the scientific name has been climate change. It's about extremes of the hydrologic cycle as well as temperature issues. <clears throat> and the forecast <clears throat> is that in the future, um, the type of rainfall will get heavier and heavier. You know, we get our strongest thunderstorms when it's really hot because hot air holds more water. So when it rains, it can, it can pour. And the expectation, and this is globally, is that it's gonna, we're going to have heavier down, uh, downpours. And we've conducted studies about um, the increase in, in our region. What if you have heavier rainfall events? What does that mean for combined sewage overflow events? And I was um, uh, talking to people, to faculty, here that uh, tell me that you, you in, uh, in uh, Philadelphia have plenty of combined sewage overflow events. <clears throat> so we, we studied the Chicago area and found that by mid-century you could have a doubling in the number of combined sewage overflow events <laughs> because of this climate change relationship between heavy rainfall, more rainfall runoff and water contamination. This water is good, right? <laughs> it did rain yesterday, didn't it? Okay, I'm going to give you one more slide of bad news before I shift gears, okay? <coughs> so, you, got, you probably can't read these graphs. One is, uh, this is looking at Syria. The top graph is, um, is rainfall decreasing. This is... Uh, temperature, and the other is the drought Palmer index. And even though you can't read this, I'll just sum up. This is a paper out of Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that right before the Syrian Civil War, they experienced the most severe drought in the, in the instrumental record. And it was documented that the rural to urban migration rate was four to five times higher than normal people leaving from drought-stricken areas going into the cities. And, you know, did this drought have anything to do with the Civil War? It's, it's a big question. But the fact that food prices, 
shot up this mass migration into the cities. Uh, and this was the strongest drought ever recorded in that area. Did it have some contribution? I don't think we will able, be, will ever be able to determine that. But it's a question. And so uh, people are beginning to change the frame of uh, climate change. In fact, you know, Obama was talking about, you know, climate change threats as something to be worried about for national security. And so it's about changing the frame. It's not just the polar bears, it's about national security. There's another um, frame to climate change. Uh, we published this cartogram map 10 years ago, in 2007. And this is a data-driven map, cartogram. And on the top, you have um, cumulative carbon dioxide emissions over 50 years. And notice the countries that you know, are most responsible for today's climate change, the United States, Germany, China. But the US is the number one most responsible for today's climate change because greenhouse gases stay in the atmosphere for 50 to 100 years. China now is out polluting us there. Um, but um, right now, as far as who's most responsible, the US, is Africa pretty responsible for greenhouse gas emissions? Not really. But if you look at the bottom map, where are the most climate sensitive diseases like malaria and malnutrition and diarrhea? Africa, India. So these poor countries that have a lot of climate sensitive diseases may be the first ones that will, will suffer from climate change. Whereas it's the industrialized countries that are smoking away, affecting uh, the rest of the world. This becomes, you know, especially Americans, we emit six times the global average CO2 per capita. So, you know, what we're doing for our energy policy is harming the rest of the world. So four years after we published this paper, I had the wonderful honor, and um, I was humbled by this meeting with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and I'm presenting him that exact map that you just saw. And he asked me, he is, he is so smart, and he cuts right to the chase, and he said, he said, Jonathan, if you know pollution kills, your country is not showing much compassion, right? Why are you still doing this? And I, you know, I thought about that for a while, and um, you know, and then re now recently with the Pope's encyclical, you know, this is a major, um, major issue. It's an ethical issue. It's one of our biggest ethical challenges uh, that we face. So, um, you know, we have other voices. Um, you know, there's there are people that don't really take climate change uh, as a big threat, but. Even with this person's voice, um, the U.S. mayors are, you know, talking about it. And so, in some ways, if, if national leadership uh, slows down on climate, there's still the local leadership. The mayor's uh, climate protection group, which is more than 1,000 U.S. cities. There's a C40 cities initiative of mega cities. I think it's up to now 70 mega cities around the world. Michael Bloomberg is involved with this you know, really pledging to go to low carbon, even if things don't happen at the federal level, at the, at the state and um, sub-regional and city level, lots of things are happening. So since the meeting with the Dalai Lama, um, you know, four years after that meeting, we have the, the Paris meeting. And I've been, when I talked to, when I te what I told the Dalai Lama was, you know, we didn't know that burning fossil fuels was dangerous for a long time. Not till it was 1952, the London smog episode that killed people, we understood that air pollution was dangerous. And it was just, you know, not so long ago that we realized that greenhouse gas emissions are disrupting the Earth's climate. But now we know. And now, you know, and, and at the Conference of the Parties, the 21st Conference of the Parties of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, it was a historic meeting. And everyone now gets it that, yes, we are disrupting the Earth's climate. We have to do something about it. 147 heads of state 
that, that convened in Paris in December of 2015 is a historic record for the number of leaders coming together in one place at one time. And most countries of the world came in with nationally intended plans for decreasing their carbon emissions. So, historic meeting. But even with the intentions of reducing their greenhouse gas emissions, if you look at the no action taking us up to 8 degrees Fahrenheit, if nothing is done, and if the country commitments that are somewhere in the neighborhood between 25 to 40 percent of greenhouse gas emissions over the next 30 years, or actually the next 20 years, you know, those are big commitments to really cut back on fossil fuel consumption. That still only gets us here if we follow those commitments. And according to the impact scientists working on climate change, the goal is to stay below 2 degrees centigrade, to stay below 2 degrees centigrade average warming to avoid catastrophic um, outcomes. And so the goal is to ratchet down quickly to get below 2 degrees centigrade. And this is where, you know, we really need immediate and, and substantial actions. And this is where you come in. Because I think that by framing climate change as a health issue, I think we can get to, we can get here faster and our solutions will go further. And this is the good news story, which is, you know, I think that, you know, when you ask this question, could policy to combat climate change be free? If you think about public health benefits or the co-benefits from climate policy, <coughs> the side benefits or the co-benefits in public health, especially in non-communicable diseases, that I think climate change policy could actually be a net gain financially. And, and here's why. You know, I think these three key sectors, we have golden opportunities in health, especially in the energy sector, transportation and urban planning, and food systems. And I'll talk mostly about the top two. At the end, I'll briefly mention a study on the bottom one, but don't have time to cover all three. And, and I'm sure you know this statistic uh, from the Global Burden of Disease report um, that outdoor air pollution kills 3.7 million people every year. Um, indoor air pollution kills more than 4 million. So we've got um, there's some overlap there, but on average, 7 million people die prematurely from air pollution, indoor and outdoor air pollution. Well, this is a study that just came out of MIT a couple years ago in uh, Nature uh, Climate Change. And this is straight out of their, their abstract, asking the question about the cost of the U.S. getting to low carbon you know, versus the health benefit from reduction in PM2.5 and ozone. Remember, when you burn oil or coal, you know, you, you get greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions, but you also get all the other nasty pollutants that we know are harmful, especially PM2.5. And so, according to this study, that the health benefits, especially from reduced PM2.5, could offset the initial investment cost to have cleaner energy technology by between 26 to 1,050 percent, or up to 10 times. The health benefit could be 10 times more valuable than the investment cost for clean energy. Um, we've done uh, some studies uh, looking at this in China. Uh, one of my uh, students, uh, Melissa Scott, uh, is doing some air pollution modeling that if China could get could reduce its uh, PM 2.5 by 32 um, percent, that would save four million lives per year in China. So China understands there's huge benefit. And um, I tweeted this um, when I saw from the uh, da Davos meeting that the Chinese president really championed, saying the Paris Agreement is fantastic, let's move forward. China understands the immediate health benefit from getting off of coal. And, and, and so China is the number one solar 
um, country in the world. Um, they do have a big problem with air pollution. Uh, they've got a lot of coal-fired power plants, but I just read, I think it was just a few weeks ago, they canceled plan for another 130 coal-fired power plants. They said, no, we're not going to do that. So they get it. And I think what's important for policymakers, especially in the United States, is to look at this question about what does it cost to clean up, you know, to get, get our CO2 emissions down. <laughs> And this is a study uh, by Jason West a few years ago that asked the question, how much would it cost in getting away from CO2 emissions? You know, to go from, from coal-fired power plants to more renewable energy, what would it cost? And he estimated it could cost up to about $30 for every ton of CO2 that you try to remove from the atmosphere. Now notice this is only one half of the slide, right? Because if you remove a ton of CO2, you also remove PM 2.5 and all the other um, harmful pollutants that we know about. And so for every ton of CO2 that you remove, you'd remove all the other pollutants such that you would, on average, have $200 in health benefits, on average. Now. To the policymakers, I ask them, you know, here's the toughest question of the day. Which number is bigger, 30 or 200? <coughs> and I've, I've presented this before, and, and many, uh, several politicians said, you know, we hadn't thought about the health side. We were only worried about paying more for clean energy. And anyone that is in public health needs to make sure this other half of the equation, or way more than half of the equation, is communicated, that there are immediate health gains, uh, and that these gains will be even greater in polluted countries like in China and in parts of, of East Asia. You know, so these gains could be up to 70 times greater where you have really bad pollution issues. And I even wonder if this $30 is an overestimate, because if you look at the trend in the cost of solar energy, in the last 40 years, the cost for solar has dropped 99%. So I think it's a golden opportunity to think about, yeah, can we convert, can we get to a low carbon economy and have those incredible health savings? And it's one reason, one rationale for this divestment movement, because these are the known oil reserves in the ground, and to stay below 2 degrees um, centigrade which is this cutoff that the impact scientists are saying, we've got to try to stay below that. This is all we can burn. You know, so we, there's five times more than the limit that we can burn that's there. So another rationale to get to a low carbon economy. So I want to shift gears away from air pollution and talk about another chronic disease trend. This is looking at a total of, of body mass index trends in the, 200 countries over a 40-year period, 20 up to almost, well, whatever, 19 million participants. So the bad news is every region in the world, if you look at men and women, this is obesity, this is severe obesity on the bottom, everywhere in the world, this problem is trending upward. And of course, you know, unhealthy food is one aspect, but I think there's another uh, issue, and I know that there are urban planners in the audience and students of urban planning, uh, from Wisconsin even. <laughs> and um, if you look at this picture, this is from my colleague, uh, um, Howie Frumpkin. You know, this is a typical suburban neighborhood. It's got fences and curvy roads that are really designed for cars, and it's not designed for walking. In fact, neighborhoods like this you know, designed for cars, not for people, and it does not promote exercise. It's contrary to a livable city. And there are surveys out of the Department of um, uh, Health and Human Services that show that 60% uh, of Americans don't meet the minimum recommended levels of aerobic exercise. So here's a, a, a good opportunity when you also think about how many trips in cars, 40% of trips, are really short trips, less than two miles or three kilometers. 
So this is a, a, you know, a golden opportunity, health opportunity, if you could get to active transport by walking or by biking. You could you know, solve this problem, and you solve both of these problems at the same time, commuting. and So I, uh, have a, I had a PhD student and then a postdoc, uh, Maggie Grabo, that led this study where we asked the question, for our Midwest, our Great Lakes region, if you look at the 11 largest cities in that region and you map where the cars are driving and you couple that to a tailpipe emissions model, so you get all the car emissions in these 11 metropolitan areas, and then you hand that to uh, Tracy Holloway's group to do the air pollution modeling and talk about where the ozone is, where the PM is, and then you come back to the EPA Ben Maps model uh, to look at where people live and you superimpose the air pollution over the people, you can ask questions like, what if those short car trips were off the road? All the short car trips, let's take them off the road. What would the change in air quality be? You can ask a second question. What if half of those short car trips in metropolitan areas are accomplished by bicycle? And only for four months of the year. No snow on the ground. Let's be conservative. So I'll just cut to the chase. The conclusion of this uh, Maggie Grabo et al. study, uh, we would save almost 1,300 lives per year. And you would have cost savings of $8 billion every year in avoided mortality costs um, and hospital admissions and absenteeism days. So those are, those are significant. And we got a lot of press from that, you know, swapping tailpipes for pedals, you know, big dividends for public health. Uh, we got study of the day, you know, anyway. <laughs> and the big news for uh, Drexel University is that Maggie Grabo, who is the first author of this study, she and her husband are moving to Philadelphia this summer. So you should, you know, she's looking for, for this type of work to be extended. Um, anyway, more on that later. <laughs> um, also, if you compare U.S. cities that have the highest rates of, of walking and cycling compared to cities with the lowest rates, uh, no surprise, but obesity rates, 20% lower, uh, diabetes rates, 23% lower. It's obvious that exercise is important for health. So we're now working, um, my group is doing a lot of work on this transportation uh, health benefit modeling. We're using this integrated transport and health impact model. And for the epidemiologists in the room, um, you know how incredibly well documented, you know, the health benefit of exercise is. And these are epidemi epidemiologic studies that show, you know, the more physical activity in uh, this is sort of metabolic equivalence per task. You know, as you increase the amount of physical activity, you decrease the risk in cardiovascular disease, diabetes, dementia, uh, depression in the elderly, and some depression in young folks, colon cancer, and breast cancer. All of these are very well documented health benefits from increasing physical activity. So we're running this model. Uh, first doing exercise, later we'll do crashes and air pollution. But right now, if you just look at exercise as just one example, if you increase weekly walking, weekly average walking in the state of Wisconsin by 10 minutes per week, so two minutes a day, you uh, have a total disability adjusted life year reduction of uh, you know, over 500 across these domains of diabetes, depression, there's cardiovascular disease, so across those different health outcomes. And if you pick three of those for cost, looking at you know, increasing 10 minutes of exercise a week uh, for outcomes of cardiovascular disease, depression, and diabetes, you're going to save more than $30 million, uh, $30 million uh, looking at uh, savings in health care and absenteeism every year. So these are, you know, these add up, and this could have, uh, you know, be important to communicate to policymakers. So I want to wrap up and just tell you there's, you know, the other domain which I won't talk much about is that there are lots of co-benefits in the food system. 
And I don't know if you can read it in the back, but that cow has a banner on it saying, I am full of greenhouse gas. Do you have a stake in it? This is during the, uh, the climate uh, march, the People's Climate March uh, in New York in 2014. I did this march with my mother, who was, I think, 88 at the time. Um, but this issue of diet and greenhouse gas emissions, this is another win-win. Um, and I'm sure most of you know this, that you know, a high meat diet has a lot of um, energy input in fertilizer, and lots and, and food for the cows and things like that, that a high meat diet is very, you know, takes a lot of energy and damages the environment. And this is looking at a fish diet, veg, vegetarian and vegan. So as you eat further down on the food chain, less of an environmental impact. But of course, we also know that, uh, this is just from the UK, you know, that if you half the meat consumption you reduce greenhouse gases, but also the, the disease burden from heart, heart attacks and stroke would fall. You know, less saturated fats in the diet. We know there's a win-win. Better for the environment, better for your health. So I'll conclude by just saying that, um, you know, addressing the global climate crisis and pushing for a low carbon economy can make us healthier and it can save money across especially these domains of uh, power generation, uh, where we get our electricity, uh, transportation, urban planning, and, and food systems. Well, with that, I will thank you very much. And um, oh, there, the Wisconsin is very red. So happy International <laughs> Women's Day. Uh, thanks for your attention. So we have about 10 minutes for questions, um, so we'll just open it up to the floor. Yes? So I think, let me start with saying that I am very pro your talk, but I think one of the issues is that this, the cost, I mean, there is a net savings in money, but it doesn't go to the same industry who ends up paying just, you know, like, it's not a closed loop system. So we save money in healthcare costs. But that money is not funneled back to the, co the fossil fuel companies who are losing profits. Right. So how do we reconcile that? So this is um, this is the role of government. You know that you know there there is a role of government, and that is to uh, optimize societal benefit. And if you have if it's the fossil fuel industry that may lose, um, it's up to the government to balance. To say, well, the greater good, there's a much greater good, and therefore that's why we have these policies. Um, and, it's, and also I would say that for the coal miners, you know, that are, you know, going to lose their jobs when we stop using coal, and it's already happening. Even, even with the latest administration trying to prop up the coal industry, it's not, the investors, the conservative investors are not investing in coal. <coughs> We need social programs, job diversification. We need to invest in coal workers and their jobs and, and have them have successful jobs. We need to take care of you know, vulnerable populations at, at whatever, whoever they are. They may be people at risk of climate change or at risk of losing their jobs. So that's where there is, there is a role for government when you know, those who may have to pay a price are not the same ones that benefit. That is a role for governmental policy. How do we convince them to do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, talk about the health framing. You know, this is where uh, I think that there is too much polarization on climate change as an environmental issue. I think there are far more people that look to the health of their families and their children and say, I get that. And to understand that, that Human health is a core part of the climate change crisis. And, and that's where I think we can, you know, I would say, argue that, that make that case as a human, you know, human health issue. Uh, we have one there and then one closer. Yeah. So just following up on this question, um, it strikes me that a health and all policies framework would be really useful in kind of framing climate change. And, you know, I've, I've reviewed some urban adaptation and mitigation and sustainability plans, and I'm always surprised by how little 
kind of public health is in these plans. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, do you have a sense of why a health and all policies framework isn't being used more in, in these arenas, and if there is benefit to using this framework? So absolutely, health in all policies is, is a mantra that we've been picking up yeah. more and more. And um, you know, bottom line, if you look at this presentation, energy policy is public health policy. Food systems policy is public health policy. Urban planning absolutely is public health policy. And uh, I'll just recount a quick story that acting, sec um, <coughs> acting Surgeon General um, Boris Nesiak made at the climate, we had a side meeting on uh, public health at the climate summit in New York. And he said, the US does not have a healthcare system. Surgeon General. And people are looking at him funny. He repeats that. He said, we don't have a healthcare system. We have a sick care system. We take care of the sick. We have hospitals, we have clinics. A healthcare system means healthy communities, safe routes to school, you know, clean air, clean water. So, you know, that, that gets traction. I think it's getting more and more traction. People do understand that we must have a good health care, you know, and, and sick care system and the, you know, health care um, area now that uh, there's a green hospitals movement, there's a health care without harm movement, <coughs> so there's a, there are a lot of hospitals that are extending their care to community, taking care of communities and, and making for healthy communities. So absolutely the health in all policies uh, is, is, a, is a very important message um, that Every decision, you know, the more we just focus on disease and disease prevention, we're going to, we're not going to, or, or disease treatment, you know, we're not going to be upstream, we're not going to be affecting large numbers of people like we need to through a health in all policies approach. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. And as a follow up, um, I streamed into the Carter um, Central event two weeks ago. Uh, when climate change and health was talked about, that you had health put together. I wonder, out of that high-level discussion, did you see any actionable pathway for this country going forward? So that was a, a great uh, meeting that happened at the Carter Center, and Jimmy Carter even showed up and spoke. Um, <clears throat> I think it really, uh, that was the kickoff meeting for the year of climate change and public health that the American Public Health Association has declared for the year 2017 with its Climax annual meeting in Atlanta again in, uh, in November, uh, the theme being climate change. I, you know, I think that um, the awareness is, is high as far as um, that this is a health issue. Um, there are... Um, you know, there are going to be multiple events happening around the country, and there are organizations that are really stepping forward. There's a Climate and Health Alliance group that is bringing together uh, people <coughs> across the health sector on this. Um, there's a new uh, medical societies, including the AMA uh, gathering that's coming. You know, this is a bit more conservative group, but they're coming to this saying, yes, this is a health issue. So I can't tell you objectively how much more things are moving, but uh, it's definitely, it's, this is the year of climate change and health, and I hope that that meeting, that meeting did get a lot of views, and you know, I can't remember how big the audience was, but that, that was a, a full packed uh, Carter Center there. Uh, okay, in the back, uh, yeah, go ahead. Again, thank you for your presentation. I, you know, I'm thinking about what you're saying, putting health, and I, I'm balancing it with the irony that something huge like the ACA that's all health and affects tens of millions just fell on its face in the first iteration of of uh, you know of a bill that's put forward. I, I tend to think, in my experience, that the advocacy for this needs to be a combination of both. And I, I was in, in our own city council at, at informational hearings on the impact of, of uh, loss of the ACA in Philadelphia. And I would just point out that um, one of the council people, this very progressive person, said, you know, no offense to everyone here, but devastating and horrible death, in case that doesn't work, we need the economic argument. I'm mm -hmm. paraphrasing her, but that is right. what she said. I, I think we need a middle. And I, I, the difference really, 
charge language between this, perhaps in the ACA, is that in the ACA you can choose who suffers. But with climate, although the poor and near poor will suffer the most, everyone suffers. So you get the innocent victim effect. Right. And that's horrible and racist and classist and terrible. But the way to battle this is to put a face on it, much like the truth campaign. Um, mm -hmm. I would just urge you to think about that, that if particular Congress people saw their grandchildren piled up, that mm -hmm. is the kind of advocacy, as horrible as it is, that works. Because no one can really envision that health impact on our children and on the future of this country. You know, when you don't have a job now, when you're in the Rust Belt, when you're a coal miner, the future getting a job, much less than your grandchildren not being alive in 2046. So you have to find a bill. Uh, for students studying advocacy, this is the key just striking that sort of sweet spot for how do you, how do you put it out there. Um, because yeah. again, I, I'm balancing what you're saying with, yes, in the ACA, we're saying all these tens of millions of people are going to fall off care and die, and that didn't seem to persuade anybody. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, those, yeah those, are, those are great points. Great points. I, you know, the fact that we're trying to move forward with um, sustainable development goals and and the Millennium Development Goals, you know, that climate change can undercut our, our gains across the board. Um, but as far as the politics go, there, there was a brand new study that came out showing that as far as air pollution, um, the states, I think it was Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, West Virginia, are the states that would have the biggest benefit from health if you got rid of the uh, coal-fired power plants. So, that was ironic, the mapping of that. You, know. you had a question? Uh, yeah. Um, kind of jumping across to Central America and the chronic kidney disease and yeah. the um, sugar cane workers. Um, I was wondering as far as if you're aware of the kind of like the response or kind of the um, attitude towards this particular finding and also kind of the steps needed to say rectify or protect the workers. I was wondering if there was sort of immediate sort of cooperation, or was there also kind of like a, a song and dance to kind of convince them that this is kind of a rough phenomenon and right. these sort of questions? Yeah, so, so I don't know as much about this subject as uh, Rick Johnson from uh, UC Denver and uh, David Wegman at Harvard is going down and doing intervention studies. And he is doing that with the sugar company approval and they're going in there and they're, they're proving that, you know, more, better hydration and shade and things like that absolutely make a big difference. There's also a, a part, another story there about um, fructose being dangerous to the kidney. If you're dehydrated and you drink high sugary drinks with a lot of fructose, that damages the kidney. That, you know, is saying, don't drink, don't drink those sweet things is another thing. So, so um, there are interventions, and the, at least from David Wegman's work with the sugar companies, they are receptive to it. Um, so it is preventable, but it's something that is a very high-risk area that just needs that extra occupational, occupational health intervention. So it's 1.15, we're out of time, so I just want to thank Dr. Katz one more time. Please. If there are any students